and Bobby Rinko. I want to welcome you to the evening upstairs at your library. Our speaker tonight joined the Civil Defense Auxiliary Fire Department in 1952. He served as a private, lieutenant, captain, and assistant chief, and he was appointed treasurer in 1960 and has served continuously in that position. During President George W. Bush's 2004 visit to Paducah, the President recognized him for his 50 years of service. And in 2008, at President Bush's invitation, he and his wife Kate attended a reception on the South Lawn of the White House to hear the President's remarks on volunteerism. He has been recognized at the opening of the new Emergency Operations Center on Coleman Road with the Jack Johnson Training Room. And he recently compiled an illustrated history of the Paducah Fire Department containing rare photographs from his personal collection. And we are thrilled to have a copy of this work in our local history collection. Let's welcome our guest, Jack Johnston, as he discusses the history of civil defense and emergency management. Jack. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank all of you for coming. I really appreciate it. This account of the organization initially known as the Baduca Fire Department Auxiliary and now known as a unit of emergency management is handicapped by the fact that records were poorly kept and maintained over the years. The relatively few newspaper clippings and photos that have been preserved often have no dates. And, much, and, and the leaders from the earlier years have answered the final bell and cannot be asked. Much of this history is from my personal recollections. I have been connected with an organization for 60 years, longer than any other living person in DES that I know of. As any history, judgment calls must, have be, must be made what to put in and leave out, and their sequence. I have a film slide presentation going of some of the calls we've made and some of our equipment. They're, they're random, they're you know, not in any particular order. The sudden onset of World War II in December 1941 caused by the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, which was preceded by massive air raids on British cities by the German Luftwaffe, caused great apprehension, bordering on hysteria among civilians in the United States who feared that such bombing attack attacks might occur in this country, even in inland cities such as Baduca. This concern was shared by the government on all levels, and even in Baduca, firemen visited the schools, including the elementary schools, explaining to the students about incendiary bomb attacks and how to, how to fight them, usually with sand. My brother went to Clark School, and he said he remembers from coming to Clark School, and he said, this looks like a plant sitting on top of a hill with two uh, smokestacks, and said, this could be a target. The federal government promoted the organization of civil defense corps in every city of any size, with wardens for each neighborhood and auxiliaries for various emergency responders, such as police and fire. By the early part of 1942, three meetings had already been held to organize such units in Paducah, and one of the most active was the auxiliary fire department. The same thing was done in thousands of cities around the country, but what was unique about this one is that it has continued in a uninterrupted service for almost 70 years until the present day of 2012. This is the history of that organization. By the early part of 1942, three organizational meetings had been held. At the third meeting, Robert Lusk, who had been named the first fire chief, presided. Speakers at the meeting included Lusk, Attorney Roy Shelburne, Paducah Fire Chief Ray Wilkins, Dr. R. W. Robertson, Fireman Thomas W. Langston. They stressed the importance of the auxiliary in both peace and war times. Training classes were to be handled by the Paducah Fire Department, and, which included first aid and rescue work. Wardens for different districts of Paducah were announced, with more to be announced later. An auxiliary police department was also started in 1942. Fourteen auxiliary policemen were to be trained in all phases of civil defense, which included chemical war warfare, the proper way of dealing with high explosive and incendiary bombs, and organizing community 
defense units. On May the 23rd, 1942, a civil defense corps demonstration was held at Carson Park. Business, businessman Charles Sawyer and attorney Thomas Waller were in charge and a practical demonstration of the approved methods of defense against incendiary bombs and other fires were given by the Pyrene Fire Extinguisher Company and the Henry A. Petter Supply Company. During the war years, the Auxiliary Fire Department function consisted of being a backup for the Paducah Fire Department and assisting in large fires. We were trained by the fire department. We'd go, we did fire station every, every month and they trained us and certified us as, as firefighters and taught us first aid. The Paducah Fire Department was often, was often un, <coughs> undermanned because of the members in the fire department had been called into service. And also because during the depression, two fire companies, number three and four, had been closed, leaving only number one downtown number five at 17th and Broadway, and number two on the south side to protect the city. At first, the auxiliary members were given cast off turnout coats as their only equipment. They were assigned an old Seagrave pumper they kept at number five fire station. They painted red, white, and blue to signify its civil defense status. The July the 10th, 1966 Sun Democrat shows a picture of the truck after it had been sold by the city for salvage, but the pump had been removed to be used for the civil defense fire boat. Shortly after it was installed in a boat, the boat sank at Clark's River before it could be used. After the war and through the 1950s, the corps' support function increased. They were provided full fire apparel, including pants, boots, helmets, turnout coats, this was important because of the large number of downtown fires that had occurred. Most of Baduca downtown buildings were old, had been through the flood, had antiquated electrical wiring, and were heated by coal burning furnaces. Plus, the fire prevention practice were left much to be desired. Some of these fire locations in the late 40s and 50s included Baduca Dry Goods, Kingwood All Auto, the Taylor Building. John Green Department Stores, West Kentucky Mattress Company, Matthews Tobacco Warehouse, and many more. All of them, the auxiliary was called out day or night, usually at night, and we fought the fire side by side with the paid firemen. When the Baduca Fire Department was called upon under mutual support agreement to go to the surrounding communities such as Brookport and Metropolis, Illinois, Mayfield, and Smithland, Kentucky, the auxiliary was always called and we would go help, with, help them fight the fires. During this era, members of the auxiliary became what became a long tradition of creating valuable on salary support equipment from cast off parts, surplus military vehicles, and some new accessories using our own skill and ingenuity. The first major project was the bank of floodlights powered by its own generator. Several of these were built and proved to be invaluable in helping fight night fires downtown, lighting rescue and emergency scenes for non-emergency events such as fires and fairs and civic functions. For several years, the squad also maintained several World War II amphibious ducks to help with water rescue operations and dragging of drowning victims. Also in the 1960s, the organization's function became to, began to evolve and it became the Civil Defense Fire and Rescue Squad. It purchased its first vehicle, a used panel milk truck from a local dairy. It was painted the city of Baduca colors, orange and black. We had to paint all our vehicles orange and black. And it had lashed to the top of an aluminum John boat. And we carried inside drag lines made from pipes, chains, and large treble hooks. We made these ourselves. Plus other various other hand tools and lights. Its function was more recovery than rescue but it proved to serve a real need to recover bodies of victims over the increasing number of drownings in the western tip of Kentucky and southern Illinois as boating and water sports grew in popularity and area lakes and, well, the area lakes and rivers. At this time, no other organization in the area had the equipment or the personnel to perform this sad but necessary task. As the need grew in the summer months, Members were called out almost every weekend. 
with, and, and we added boats, motors, and trailers. We're added for our, to our own equipment. Trucks, mostly small ar army surplus service types were also added. And we, of course, at that time, we were making calls up to Kentucky Lake, below Kentucky down, down in Ballard County, we were going all over. For probably 20 years, the organization was financed primarily by the city of Paducah, even after it began to service areas outside the city. But eventually, the McCracken County Fiscal Court st started providing financing. And through, the work, and through the work of the Civil Defense Director, who was paid, various state and federal grants were obtained. In the late 1960s, I mean, in the late 1960s, we purchased a 1941 American of the France fire pumper. And we also, we were fighting field fires and some structure fires in McCracken County and surrounding areas. At that time, there wasn't really any county fire departments. And the forestry people came to us and asked us if we would do this. They said they needed help. They were having to fight these fires themselves. We also added an Army surplus tank truck We'd provide water to areas without hydrants and an army jeep, which we put a tank and a pump on to be an off-road vehicle. In addition, the squad purchased and kept on hand the largest supply of firefighting foam in the area and was often called upon by the state police and other agencies to provide help at overturned gasoline trucks and other vehicle fires and accidents. Two of these truck fires are here in the angle or down it were down at the center. We had to go down, put the fire out, and then retrieve the bodies from them. There was another one, which is, they don't have a picture of, which was a real interesting one. We got a call for a gasoline truck, and it turned over up close to where you turn to go to Boy Scout Camp on 68. And they called us, and we went up there. And when we got there, the tank truck was down on its side. Gasoline was seeping from the overflow pipes, and guys were running down through the ditch and across the field and into a creek. And, we stay, stood, stayed by and helped them to, as they overturned the truck, put foam on it to keep it from sparking, and then they pulled the truck and the, the, uh, out of the area and the EPA and the state police, they didn't know what to do with all, all this gasoline and all things. They said, all we know to do is light it. So we all backed out of the way and they lit it, and it just like a big explosion, and it was like a snake of fire that just went down through there, down and through the, into the creek and back under the roads and down through the woods. So when it was through, we took our fire truck down, went back down, put all the fires out. <laughs> in 1974, the county brought the, bought the squad its first new service truck, which carried the jaws of life and other types of rescue equipment. The jaws, which is now standard equipment on most fires and rescue trucks, is a hydraulic cutting device used to extricate victims of auto crashes and industrial accidents. The squad was the first organization in the city or the county to have one. Two days after putting the jaws into service, the squad was called upon to use it to extricate a man, worker's arm from a conveyor belt at Long Block Company. At first, we made all the extra, extrications. Anytime that there was wrecks in this, in this area, they called us to come cut, you know, take, get the people out of the vehicles. During the 1970s, the original function of the organization as the City of Paducah Fire Department Auxiliary had come to an end for several reasons. The city had added two new fire companies, number three at 12th and Burnett to serve the north side, number four at 31st and Jackson Street to better serve the west end, so they had more help at major fires and better construction codes, better enforcement, the end of coal-fired furnaces and stoves meant fewer fires. There was also an undercurrent from res in resentment from the paid firemen. Some of them feared unrealistically that the existence of the auxiliary to reduce their leverage with the city government during contract negotiations. Also by the end of 1970s, four tax-supported independent fire departments were organized in many different areas of McCracken County with the same thing happening in, in surrounding counties. So when the surplus the France puffer became disabled, the fire function was dropped, and the organiz organization became rescue only. The city continued to financially support the squad until 2007. Then they came to the conclusion that since most of the services were being provided outside the city limits, they would no longer do so. 
Thus, the circle was complete, from city support only to both city and county to county only. Of course, considerable support comes from state and federal grants and in-kind aid and equipment. All the, all the, although the squad is now mostly adequately financed and well equipped, some monetary help from the city would enable more improvements. Although the city government is quick to call the squad for traffic control, for first aid support, for the fundraising runs, downtown festivals, the fireworks, major wrecks, clean up and dump day, and other activities, they decline to provide any financial help. About all the time this chain thing, the state of Kentucky changed the dated civil defense name to the more accurate disaster emergency services. In 2000, the name was again changed to Office of Emergency Management, which now includes the Rescue Squad, the Light and Power Unit, and since 2009, the Auxiliary Police. But Duke of McCracken County has been fortunate to have been served by several dedicated civil defense directors. Frank Steele served from 1950 to 1973. He was responsible for obtaining civil defense, their first building, and starting the program of securing surplus military equipment and trucks, which were converted into rescue vehicles. The 1941 American La France fire truck was purchased during his term, and also a fireboat, which unfortunately sank in Clark River before it could be used. Frank Carlson, who helped start civil defense in 1942, was serving as DES chief. He took over the director's job as well when still resigned. Carlson served both functions for five years. Then he had to resign because of health problems. Buddy Smith then served as director from 1972 to 1990. Buddy helped make a closer relationship with both the city and the county government, was, was instrumental in building the first command vehicle from a bus, building the present emergency operations center. Kent King took control in 1990 and helped secure newer equipment, a much improved radio system, more warning sirens. I am particularly indebted to Kent King for causing George W. Bush to recognize me for 50 years of service with emergency management when the president visited Paducah in 2003. That was kind of really the highlight of my life was Kent called me and the emergency management people in Washington called and asked him if there was anybody in Baduka he need, they needed to recognize when they came and I had served 50 years and Kent recommended me so the White House called me and asked me all kinds of information on when I started what I'd done and all the other volunteer jobs and and then uh, they said they were going to give all this to the president when he arrived, came and they told us we could my wife and I could drive out there and to park at the weather station they said, everybody else, all the city and county officials had to ride a bus out there, but we could drive. And they, they, the Secret Service would meet us at the, at the weather stations, which they did. And they escorted us up to the back gate. And when they walked up to the gate, the man said, this is Mr. and Ms. Johnson, they're guests of the president. Well, I nearly lost it right there. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, took us in, and when the pr plane landed, I went over to the steps, and when the president came off, I welcomed him to Maduka and shook his hand. He thanked me for my volunteerism and all I'd done. And we had our picture taken together. And several weeks later, he sent me a, a, a letter of thanked me for the warm reception in Maduka and sent me the picture with, you know, signed with, from him for being here. And then in, in five years later, in 2008, my wife and I got this invitation to come to the White House. He was giving a speech on volunteerism to different organizations, you know, the Army, all the armed services and everybody were invited. And uh, he invited the people he had recognized and for volunteers around the country. And so we went and it was a very nice thing and then we got the tour of the White House and we got through. <clears throat> Kent also encouraged Bo Dotson to return to school and, went and attained his meteorological degree and become the emergency management's first meteorologist. After King's untimely death, Benny Harper took over on an agreed temporary basis until Bob McCowan was hired. McCowan resigned after one year, and Bob Wise, who was chief at DES, served on an interim basis until Paul Carter was appointed in 2009. The chiefs of the Auxiliary Fire Department Rescue Squad DES have been Bob Lusk, Bob Davis, Frank Carlson, Benny Harper, Ed Duff, 
Tommy Emerson, and presently Bob Wise. Most of the directors put in more hours than they are compensated for. In the case of chiefs and members, thousands of hours with no compensation at all. Records do not show who the first chief of the auxiliary police was. The first one I remember was Vernon Ham. John Bolte became fire chief around 1970, followed by Eddie Neha, Eddie McManus, Harold Clark, and Robert Lee, who was chief when the auxiliary police were disbanded in 2009. Like the others, the chiefs and members of the auxiliary police serve as, served as volunteers without <coughs> compensation. The first home of the fire and rescue squad was the old abandoned Corps of Engineers facility on Meyer Street. That's the present location of the Port Authority. After several years, we were given the use of the old number two fire station at 4th and Elizabeth. And later they built us a two bay building next door to it, which we used. But when the city decided they needed this building for the flood wall department in 1976, the squad was moved to their third abandoned building, the former Kentucky Highway Garage on North 32nd, a large but leaky, uninsulated sheet metal building where we were until November of 2011. We are now in our new emergency service building on Coleman Road. Over the 70 years, in addition to above mentioned fires, the organization has played a key role in many emergency situations both small and large. After the rescue division was formed and the first vehicle being a former milk, milk delivery truck, the first call was to retrieve a body of a small boy who was drowned after slipping from the banks of the Noble Park Lagoon. And soon after a similar accident, the body of a teenage girl who, was, who had drowned in the Ohio River near the foot of Camel Street. Since the first two, calls have been countless Literally, since few records have been kept, varied and interesting, involving animals as well as humans. The following are a few of the more unique. The squad was called once by a man who found his cow trapped in a deep ravine. Now, we don't usually do this, but I think he was a friend of somebody on the squad, and they called to see if we could do anything. The squad was called by this man who found his cow. The squad was attached a cable between two trees on either side of the, of the ravine, then winched the cat, the cow put uh, paper, put, uh, what am I, uh, anyway, put stuff around the cow, and winched the cow up, and then slid it along the cable to the top of the bank. The owner was very appreciative and wrote, wrote in the newspaper, Baduka Sun, thanking us for the, our help. Another involve, call involving an animal, a horse had lain down in a stall to sleep, and somehow in his sleep had managed to get his legs under a farm truck loaded with sawdust, also in the barn, and then in panic became wedged in. A veterinarian was called in to sedate the animal, but the rescue squad then needed to use an inflatable airbags to lift one side of the truck out, and we helped slide the horse out to both the light of both him and his owner. We also have rescued cats and dogs from backwater. I remember one time we were all out back uh, sandbagging out at High Point, and this man drove up and said, there's a cat out in the backwater back down the road here on a tree, and we can't get to him. There's anything y'all can do. And Kent stopped and took some men, and went down there and went out in the backwater and got the cat. Kent, Kent, Kent took it home with him. One Christmas Eve, we received a call that a woman had caught her finger in a drain hole. When we arrived, we found her little finger caught in the drain hole of a stainless steel beer barrel. <laughs> she had put her pinky finger in to clean out the drain, and when it got caught, she began to jerk on it, which of course caused it to swell. We cut the top out of the barrel, put it in a vise, and cut through the top using a Dremel tool while running water over the metal to keep it from heating up. It was a very slow and tedious job. By early Christmas morning, she was free. A similar call came once from the Western Baptist Hospital emergency room. A restaurant walk worker had been brought in with his hand caught in a potato peeler. The restaurant had moved the body of the peeler, but his hand was still tangled in the blades. Well, the hospital called their maintenance department, and they came up and looked at it, and they said, call the rescue squad. They didn't know what to do. So we again used our Dremel tool to cut away the blades. 
One winter day, the rescue squad received a call that four children had walked across frozen waters of Island Creek to a small island. When they tried to return, the ice began to crack and they returned to the island and were stranded. The squad put a flat bottom boat on the ice and one of the members slid his way across the ice, pushing the boat to the island. We loaded the children in and then the rest of the rescue squad pulled the boat back to the mic with a the rope they had attached to the relieved parents. One day I received a frantic call from my secretary at Johnston Brokerage. She had come home from shopping and found her young daughter calling for help. The child had come home and found the house locked, so she came up with the idea of climbing from the deck to the roof and descending down the chimney to the fireplace, not realizing that the damper was closed. I gathered some men in our rescue truck and we went to a subdivision in the Lone Oak area. Fortunately, the girl was not stuck, so we dropped the rope down and pulled her back, scratched, bruised, and dirty, to her relieved mother. DES was called one day to Golconda, Illinois, where the, to where the towboat Bayou Cuba, loaded with 18,000 gallons of diesel fuel, was floating down the Ohio River burning. DES was called because of our supply of f f firefighting foam and because we were the most qualified rescue squad in the area. We fought the fire for a day and a half, but every time we'd think we'd get it out, it kept reigniting. From, from kept reigniting. So at, finally, with the working with the uh, Coast Guard, we all decided the best thing to do was to sink the boat. So we filled it from the back end with foam and water and sank the boat. We got a real nice commendation from the Coast Guard. But we also had another interesting call, a mutual assistant call. We were called by the Kentucky State Police and Livingston County authorities to assist with a Royal Crown Cola semi-trailer salt drink truck that had overturned on Dyer Hill on US 60, pinning the driver underneath and inside the cab. We dug down beside the cab and cut a hole in a large, in a hole in large enough for a doctor to crawl in and start IVs. But every time the record would try to move the truck, we were afraid we would hurt the, dr the driver. So we called in, or they called in a crane from up there, one of the mines up uh, close to Smithland, and they came in and lifted the truck up where we could pull the driver and the doctor out and rush him to a waiting ambulance. I was alone at headquarters one day when the phone rang. It was the Baduca Police Department. This was the day before Central Dispatch. They said that John Barker, the McCracken County coroner was on the radio. I turned on the radio to answer, and John said that he was stranded on the Illinois side of the Ohio River across from Barclay Park. This was the days before the executive end. I gathered a couple of other members, and we put a boat in at the foot of Broadway and went across and down the river until John flagged us in. He was relieved to see us and told us that, he, that the police had called him and told him two men had reported seeing a body on the Illinois shore. Well, John, when John went to the river to talk to them, they offered to take him across to the river to see, see about it. However, while he was out examining the body, they unexpectedly departed and left him stranded with the remains. We helped John put the body in a body bag and all went back to the foot of Broadway. The bazaar is not unusual for DES. As already mentioned, all kinds of structural fires, field fire, even boat fire were fought by the squad in the early years. And in September 1968, it was called by for a fiery airplane crash. There's a slide of the airplane. The regular evening airplane had taken off from Barclay Field and failed to gain altitude and crashed and was burning a short distance from the field. The ES squad responded with our fire truck, the, re the rescue truck, and the light generator truck. The Duke of Fire Department responded, and I think West McCracken. We all fought with, with our foam and water we put out the fire. Some members of the DES stayed over through the night and the next day to guard the wreckage and the mail until FFA officials could reach the scene. 18 to 20 percent of the mail was saved. I had mail along there from Johnson Brokerage Company, and several weeks later I got high burnt checks back from the postal service. Uh, letters were written to the airline in Barkerville showing that 20 gallons of foam and 98 hours were, were expended. 
There were two men injured, but they were taken to the hospital. One, over the years, the rescue squad has assisted the county, county coroner's office many times in the Macrobe, but, and but necessary task of recovering long, undiscovered, decomposing bodies. This involves donning special masks, protective gear, gathering up the body and our parts, and cleaning up the area. Such, such tasks are odious and unpleasant, but necessary in the life and death of a community. And as usual, if the rescue squad won't do it, who will? Along these same lines, the squad dive teams, those with special treating, training have helped retrieve bodies also recover large amounts of numbers of stolen merchandise guns cars and trucks from the rivers and lakes and ponds the dive team which was formed many years ago takes advanced training each year in swift water rescue i think they go all the way to prestonburg kentucky they have the dive team has their own dive, dive truck and trailer during the flood of 2011, the team was kept very busy. They did 43 swift water rescues, and then when they were in between, they were securing floating propane tanks. In fact, the rescue squad and the, and the dive team went just a couple of weeks ago up to Joppa Landing to help to retrieve those two bodies up there. Besides the hundreds of extrications made before cars had airbags and other departments had the jaws of life, the rescue squad has made and still makes many river rescues for, for stranded boaters. In fact, we made one yesterday. We could do body recoveries and search for lost persons. In recent years, storm watching and storm cleanup takes many hours and increasingly has called for traffic control at the scenes of serious traffic accidents while police conduct the, the required reconstruction and the paid patrols are thus released to go about their business. In addition to all the emergency and public assistance work, DES also maintains and checks on a monthly basis 19 warning air raid sirens, which are tested the first Saturday of every month. Over the years, the squad has taken on the non-emergency but necessary jobs that no other organization is willing to undertake. This includes Charity fun runs, marathons, triathlons, the Lions Club Telethon, McCracken County Fair, the Relay for Life, Barbecue on the River, Christmas Parade, Fireworks, the Annual Cleanup or Dump Day. All those these events are non-emergencies. The fact that the DES members are trained in first aid and many have EM training help protect the public at these events. Last but not least are the natural disasters. Some of the most significant are as follows. On Memorial Day weekend, 1982, Marion, Illinois suffered a devastating tornado. And the Rackham County Rescue Squad was called upon under mutual aid agreement to help the victims. Some of the slides of the, you see of the devastation up there. We took several trucks and a number of men and we went up there and stayed all night, part of a day. We used our lights and we all were helped looking for victims of the tornado. On January the 16th, 1994, an unprecedented, unpredicted snow form of 22 inches followed by a sub-freezing temperature struck the region, overwhelming the government <coughs> snow removal resources. For days, the rescue squad, using its army surplus four-wheel drive trucks, shuttled doctors and nurses between their homes and hospitals, answered emergency calls, took patients to hospitals, and ferried dialysis patients to treatment centers. Literally, the first two or three days, there was a law about the city, county, and state that nobody could be on the roads unless there was emergency vehicles. And there was doctors at the hospitals that couldn't get home, and doctors at, the, at home that couldn't get to the hospital. So we'd go to the hospital, pick up some doctors and nurses, and take them home, go pick up some more, and bring them to the hospital. And then there was dialysis people. You, you can't wait on that, so we'd go get the dialysis patients and take them to the hospital, and when their treatment was over, we'd take them back home. The Ohio River flooding of 1997 impacted all the areas of the county outside the city flood wall. An emergency operations center was activated, which handled over a thousand calls, messages, and assignments. The squad helped ev evacuate people from their homes, did sandbagging around the county. In previous years, similar assistance has been given to the flood victims in Smithland, Kentucky. We've been up to Smithland, Kentucky because put our pumps up there and pumped the water back out as it was seeping into the town. 
Even in years without major floods, there's often heavy rains caused by backwater problems in low-lying areas of the county, which require help in evacuating and transporting stranded victims. The city, that's another thing, the city, anytime there's heavy rains and the city streets are flooded like 21st and Old Mayfield Road and Kentucky Avenue and over 28th and Monroe, the city calls us to come out and help them get the stranded victims and block streets. Another notable disaster was the great ice storm of January 2009, a hopefully 100-year event which snapped thousands of power lines, millions of trees and limbs, causing highways and roads to be blocked and closed, shutting off electricity power for 90% of the region, ending most telephone communications, even cell phones. Then temperatures dropped below freezing. The emergency management center on Coleman Road was unworkable because of communication difficulties, and operations were moved to Reedland Fire Department building. The rescue squad's command center was brought in to supplement communications, and portable generators we had were loaned out to provide power for homes with people with special needs. The rescue squad was also called upon to move people from their homes to warming centers. But we had to cut trees and limbs before we could even get out of the streets or get to their homes or get to their houses. We, we, the squad was, was headquarters on 32nd Street, was open 24 hours a day, and many members ate and slept there. Their power was off anywhere from three days to three weeks, depending on the location. One of the big disasters that the emergency management and rescue squad responded to was the flood of 2011. During the flood, the EOC on Coleman Road opened 24-7 for 28 days with the help of a volunteer staff. There was 1,750 landlines called to the center, accounting for 2,147 minutes. The flood went on the record as the third largest disaster in the state's history. McCracken County had 386 homes affected and local residents received $4.8 million in individual assistance. Our rescue squad, with the help of sister teams who came in from northern Kentucky, conducted 43 swift water rescues in the two and a half weeks, and they also helped uh, secure propane tanks that were floating. A total of 340,000 sandbags were distributed to the, to the residents of McCracken County. One of the big things, we'd get calls for people that they thought they could stay in their house. They wanted to, you know, they were under water, never gotten that high before, and they thought, well, I, I can live, I'm going to protect my house, I'm going to stay here. And they would drive out to the grocery or drive out to work, and then when they came back in, the water had come up, and the car got floated out, or they got off the road and got in the water, and then they called on the cell phone and asked us to come help them. And we had a tremendous amount of calls. A welfare check. People from out of the state would call and say, my parents live in town. I can't get a hold of them. Would you please go check on them? And you know, one of the biggest things was people would call, is water going to get to me? Do I need to move? And we'd say, where are you? And we had a map and we'd try to pinpoint where they were. And then if we told them, yeah, you better, you know, at that time we thought the water was going to get to 55 feet. And we'd say, yeah, you better, you better move. The next question was, who's going to move us? Where do I move? Who's going to pay for this? I mean, it was a very trying time for many people. Another interesting story about the DES Rescue Squad happening in the summer of 1997. Warner Brothers Studio called us to come to Bay City, Illinois and help with the filming of the movie U.S. Marshals, directed by Stuart Baird and featuring stars Tommy Lee Jones, Wesley Snipes, Robert Downey Jr., and Tom Wood. Members of the rescue squad would leave Paducah early each morning with several pieces of equipment and boats. We were the rescue squad depicted in the film fighting the fire and looking for and recovering bodies. It was a fun alternative to our serious work we usually do. The men and women who participated were paid a nominal sum and the county was given a large donation which they used the money to buy the rescue squad pieces of new equipment. Importantly, when we left each day, we made sure we had a crew in Paducah to answer any you know, local emergencies. The growing awareness of weather events and the improvements in their predictability has brought a new dimension to DES. As mentioned in the article above, Bo Dotson in 2005 
became the official meteorologist with McCracken County Office of Emergency Management, <clears throat> working closely not only with DES, but keeping all emergency agencies in western Kentucky, southern Illinois, and western Tennessee aware of approaching storms and extreme conditions, often several days out. He is fortunate to have resources in his home high on a hill in southern Illinois, equipped with the latest meteorological communications equipment and has a close relationship with the U.S. Weather Service. He gives emergency management several days notice via email, Facebook, and Twitter. When, when severe weather is approaching and the storms grow nearer, the weather spotters go into the field. Bo stays in contact with us by radio, giving us the continued updates and we, in turn, report back to him what we are seeing. He needs to know what size you know, trees or limbs are down, where roads are flooded, what size hail we're seeing. And th this is all important. All this information is then transported, transported to the Weather Bureau and the news organization so the public can be kept better informed. When the ice storm was coming in 2009, I remember Bo getting on the radio and telling us nearly a week ahead, this is going to be the worst ice storm history. You better be prepared. And he was right on target, like he is with most of his predictions. Bo has been recognized by the Kentucky House of Representatives for his outstanding contribution to the Kentucky Transportation Department and to the, and the Paducah Emergency Management Team. All this he does, like every, like every, well, everyone else in DS, except the director, without compensation. Most important thing we all need to remember is we all need to have weather radios. In recent years, at the direction of the Homeland Security, training requirements for members of the rescue squad has become increasingly complex, intense, and demanding of members' times and pocketbooks. And sometimes they have to miss work to attend classes. DES trains every Tuesday night. Making it difficult is that all this training that they're doing, all these times they're giving this, we're making it, the, the, the knowledge that these situations may come tomorrow, but on the other hand, they may never come in our lifetime, but it's still important. But risk factors such as the possibility of terrorism by extremists, tornadoes, and earthquakes along the New Madrid Fault make it all necessary. As can be determined from all these accounts, which represent only a small fraction of the calls made. The mission of the rescue squad has evolved over the years, from a simple auxiliary fire department to a myriad of assignments, ranging from the urgent and intensely dangerous to the tedious and the mundane. But each is unique and important, and even life-changing to the organizations and the people involved. When we're out like we were this past week, cutting trees when the roads are blocked and you're out in the rain, standing in the rain, cutting trees. That's important. It's, it may not be to a lot of people, but people live on that road. It's tr important to them because they want to get home or they may to get out to go to, the, to, the, go to work or whatever. They may have be getting ready to have a baby and they, that gets life ch change in them. All this thing is your tax dollars at work. The emergency rescue squad has made, I think it's 143 after those yesterday, 140 emergency calls so far in 2012. That's a lot of calls. Before closing, I would like to give special thanks to the fiscal for court for their new $2 million emergency equipment rescue building on Coleman Road and the great equipment we have. They have been very supporting in helping us serve the citizens of McCracken County. The fiscal court is right now updating our um, EOC, our Emergency Operations Center, so when a disaster comes, we'll be better, it'll be a better, better shape. We have come a long way, folks. When I first joined, we had, we were called by what we call the calling tree. If some, when we got a call by the fire department, they'd call the chief or an officer, and he'd call two men, they'd call two men, they, until we finally got, got our people called. And then we, when, Clyde Wood, which was a member, or I decided he would be our dispatcher. And Clyde, we had CB radios. We thought we were high tech. And he'd get on the radio and call. He had emergency traffic. And he'd tell that, and then he'd get on the phone, and he'd call, and he finally got enough men to, to, to respond. 
Then we got VHF radios and pages, which we really got upstairs. Then with rebanding, we got the 800 megahertz radio, which gives us better communications and we can reach out a lot further. And the newest thing we've got is the fire horn. When the central dispatch sets off our pages, they also set off something called the fire horn, and that will ring our cell phones and give us a text message. So we can get it to get it several different ways, which is real helpful. When I was in Chicago a few weeks ago, I knew what the rescue squad was doing in Baduca because my pager would go off and I'd never hear you know, what they were doing. And it's really, though, it's valuable for people who are out, maybe you're out to suffer someplace and you don't have your pager or you're out of town on the way back in, you know when you get back in you read your report because you've heard a call. Uh, there's a new thing coming into McCracken County called mass notification. This is kind of a new breaking news. And the this county is putting this in. There's going to be no cost to the citizens of McCracken County. You can sign up for it. And as I understand it, it's not all in yet, but they'll, you'll be hearing about it and knowing about it. But you can <coughs> sign up and give them your phone number, whether you want your hot lab line, your cell phone, or a text message, or whether you want, I think, even email. And if there's an emergency in your part of the county, we'll say we've got a train derailment in West McCracken, and you need to notify those people out there of the emergency, whatever it is, you set off those telephones, and that when they pick it up, they've got a message of what the emergency is and what they need to do. Or the same thing, which would be a big help, is for the people who we have a, uh, golden alerts when there's a child that's wandered off or an Alzheimer's person has wandered off and we know they're, they're in Reedland or something, we can just set off the pages and that'll give us more eyes to help try to find the lost persons. Last but not least, I want to thank all of the members, men and women of DES and Emerge Humanity who give of their time to serve and to Paul Carter and Bob Wise for their great leadership. It's very important what each of you do. Thank you.